The web that we all use, the web 2.0 is going through a revolution. The way users interact with it and the way we as developers build for it is changing radically. We need to change the way we think about websites and how we make them. We need to update the mental models from web 2.0 and replace them with new ones. This revolution, this new way of building applications for the web is called web 3. Annyeonghaseyamnika! Nicolas Imidan, welcome to a new video. If you like this kind of blockchain content and you want to see more, then please consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel. Let's get started. To understand Web3, we have to talk about Web2.0. And for that, let's first talk about Web1.0. Web1.0 was when the internet started, when there were no web designers, when websites were kind of ugly and full of GIFs. This is how Amazon looked like in 1995. This is Disney in 1996, this is Apple in 1997, and this is Coca-Cola's website in 1999. Yuck! With Web 1.0, if you wanted to put your content on the internet, you could, but you had to know how to make a website and set up a server and all that. The content on the Web 1.0 was mostly static, where users were only the consumers of data. This was also in part because from a developer's point of view, websites could not do that much. The browsers and languages like JavaScript and CSS were not powerful enough. Making a website do cool stuff or at least making it look beautiful was incredibly hard. To give you an example of how bad it was, if today you have a rectangle and you want to give round corners to it, all you have to do is write one line of code, border radius, and it will be done. That simple thing was not even possible before. We had to create four images of the four corners and we had to manually position each one of them. Crazy. After Web 1.0 came what we now live on and that is Web 2.0. Web 2.0 is when the rise of social media happens, where instead of static websites, user-generated content takes the center stage. Before, the users were the consumers of data. With Web 2.0, they became the producers of that data. Web 2.0 created all the social media giants that we have today. And that was helped by the fact that we now have what people from the 90s would have considered a supercomputer in our pocket. The thing that happened with user-generated content is that it all ended up flowing to the same websites. Where in the web 1.0, you found a website that you liked because somebody told you about it and you had to put it in your bookmark so you don't forget. In the web 2.0, you don't visit that many websites and you know where to go to depending on the type of the content. Photos, Instagram. Videos, YouTube. Short video, TikTok. Short text and opinions, Twitter. Bragging about your career? LinkedIn. This is what we can describe as centralization. All this data created by us, it's all going to the same places, stored in databases that we have no access to. Having all these massive amounts of data made these companies very rich. They learned that they can use the data you create to sell you things or sell the data itself as a product. Apart from benefiting disproportionately from other people's data, another thing that Web 2.0 did for social media companies is that it gave them power over the public discourse. If they decide they want to censor you, they will. If they decide that what you are saying should not be heard, they will turn you off. Companies, careers, debates, news, discussion, they are all developing inside of platforms that we have no control over. These companies are being used as public goods, but they aren't public goods. On Web 2.0, you have to trust. You have to trust that the companies that have your data won't do anything bad with it, and that they will respect your privacy. Even though if you programmed a backend server before, you know how trivial it is to build an admin panel and see all the records on a database. You also have to trust and hope that these companies won't censor you or quietly modify the algorithm to make you change your opinion on things. Now, here is when Web3 comes in. Dr. Gavin Wood, the co-founder of Ethereum and the creator of Polkadot and Kusama, was the first to come up with the word Web3. On his own words, Web3 is the service without the service provider. Using things like blockchains, smart contracts, cryptography, peer-to-peer -peer networks, among many other things, we can replace the infrastructure of Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. We can remove the middleman and create applications that are not controlled by a single entity. 
Applications where the users own and control the data they produce. Applications where you don't have to trust. Trustless applications that you can verify and audit anytime you like. These applications will be decentralized, which means they will not be hosted in one single server, controlled by one single party. They will be stored in a network of computers. They will be replicated across the network, making them censorship resistant. Web3 apps should not feel different than Web 2.0 apps from the user point of view. The difference will be on the infrastructure, on the backend of the services. Almost every piece of how a web service is made, apart from the UI, will be replaced by a public, open source and decentralized solution. Instead of using a database, your website will store its data on a blockchain. Instead of writing your backend code thinking it's going to run in a server hosted on AWS, you will instead write a smart contract that will be stored on a blockchain and executed by a decentralized virtual machine. Instead of having user accounts, your users will have a wallet and they will own their identity and their security. Instead of storing static files, the JS and the CSS, on Netlify or Vercel, and instead of storing user uploads in AWS S3, you will use interplanetary file system or Airweave. Instead of using third-party APIs to get external data, like market data, sports data, weather data, news data, whatever, you will use oracles like Chainlink or Flux. Those projects, which I am not telling you to invest on, by the way, are just a small part of all the projects that are being built to be the building blocks of the infrastructure required to build a web that is more open and transparent. This does not mean that Web3 does not have its detractors. Some people say that Web3 is total BS. And even Elon Musk says that it seems more like a marketing buzzword than a reality right now. And I agree with this. Today it is used mostly as a buzzword by companies that think they can sprinkle a little bit of Web3 and blockchain along with a little bit of metaverse to look cool. The truth is that it is hard to predict what kind of services will be born with Web3 infrastructure, not because it is useless, but because it is too new. What we can do today with Web3 is not something we thought it was real. We have been thinking with Web 2.0 mental models for too long. We can't even imagine the things that will be built because they just weren't possible to build before. In 1943, the chairman of IBM said, and I quote, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers, end quote. In 1995, the creator of the Ethernet said, quote, I predict the internet will soon go spectacularly supernova and in 1996, catastrophically collapse. Now, I don't think they said this because they were idiots. I think that with the information they had at the time, in the context of a world in 1943, computers actually looked useless. In the context of 1995, the internet might have seemed like a buzzword as well. Companies and governments were working well without it. If you asked me in 1995 what companies would benefit the most from the internet or what can be built using the internet, I would have not been able to predict Uber or Netflix. When the internet came, what happened was not that the already existing companies just migrated to it and became more productive. It wasn't that bakeries and hair salons just got a website and we just kept going. What happened was that apart from killing certain companies, the internet created its own companies. It made possible companies that were not possible before. Amazon, Google, Twitter, Facebook, some of the most valuable companies on the planet are not possible without the internet itself. They don't make sense in a world without internet. Larry and Sergey from Google didn't come up with the idea of a search engine before the internet existed and were just waiting anxiously for it. It was when the internet arrived that they saw its potential and started building. Bezos wasn't also waiting for the internet to get started building Amazon. When the internet came, he saw the potential and the opportunity. I personally think that it will be the same with Web3. The services and apps that are being built on Web3 will not make sense in a world without Web3. Just like Google doesn't make sense in a world without the internet. And that is the end of this video. Thank you for watching. If you ever felt curious about the meaning of Web3, I hope that you found the explanation on this video useful. If you like this kind of content and you would like to see more, then please consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel. It really, really helps. Thank you. See you on the next video.
And please let me know in the comments if there is any other blockchain related word that you are curious about. I am making some sort of a blockchain dictionary and I am looking for words to put on it. And don't forget, if you want to learn to code and you want to do it for free with me, click on the link below and I will see you there. Stay free, be happy, see you on the next one, bye.